First question for Richard. Uh, I'm just curious. I know that you are sitting in cash right now. Um, the markets have been choppy. What are what are you ultimately looking for to to start getting uh, exposure? Yeah, sure. So it's it's definitely been pretty choppy and difficult to trade. I I've tried some few a few test positions. I tried some this morning. Got stopped out pretty even on on Tesla and Nvidia. Um, but what I'm kind of watching for is basically an end to the volatility and the start of some more constructed bases and setups to appear um, and kind of a divergence between the growth stocks and the rest of the market. So right now, um, we're just kind of in a distribution phase. There's not really any trend one one way or the another, or another, whether an uptrend or downtrend. We had the fall through day signal yesterday, um, but unfortunately, we, we had a lot of distribution today, which kind of nullified that in my mind. Um, so it's just really kind of difficult to trade one way or the other. So uh, for me, cash is the best position to be in at, as of this moment. Um, yeah, I'm just wait, kind of waiting for more clarity. For me, uh, my my best results come when we're trending above a 21 EMA on indexes like the NASDAQ, IWM, IWO. Um, and right now we just don't have that clear trend. So uh, for swing traders, and this is something that I've really been trying to work on a lot, especially this year, um, having got a little chopped up in February, is just uh yeah kind of knowing when to not trade if that makes sense like knowing when you're just going to chop yourself up going to take a lot of paper cuts in a row um and uh this is something ray ray really emphasized a lot and i've learned a lot from him this year um sometimes it's best to just kind of wait for stuff to develop and uh and know when you want to be super defensive out of the market for the most part um until conditions really uh, show that they've changed so um, yeah, I'd like to throw it over to you, Ray, too, and kind of answer the same question. What, what are you kind of waiting for as of this moment? Yeah, Ray's really big on uh, progressive exposure. I know you guys probably see him talk about it a lot on his Twitter. So if you could elaborate on, you know, progressive exposure, uh, we talk about, you know, we want to see the market invite us in. So like, what would the market have to do to really invite you in? <clears throat> so uh, like a few things. One, uh, when you're moving from cash to that first position, what we need to establish is, um, say, say you put on an NVIDIA through the 300 mark and put your stops at the 50 day, or you initiate an NVIDIA right around the 50 day, actually. Um, you want to see those, those type of stocks, especially the semi group that's holding up, at, you know, uh, pretty well across the board, even, even after today. Um, you you want to make progress on that first position so that you can finance your risk for the next one. What many traders do, especially especially when you're new in the market, and, and you know when I was new in the market as well, some 12 years ago, uh, I never thought about it like that. So, taking that first position, getting some sort of cushion on that position, and then you're basically financing your risk when you go from position one to position two, so that if position one comes back in, you aren't losing your shirt in, in a matter of a day. So, just to summarize, it, it's a really good. Uh, way to sort of increase your exposure in the market, especially just the past two days, for example, we had uh, the NASDAQ and the S&P rally quite a bit uh, and even registered a follow through day yesterday. But then today we, we saw a full almost a full reversal of those gains uh, that came after that post, -fest, uh, post Fed announcement. Right. So if you weren't exercising progressive exposure and, and financing your risk from position one to two to three, what ends up happening is you lose your shirt today because all of them are coming back in at once. Right. And, and you really haven't made any progress in the markets for you to warrant having five, six, seven positions on uh, just based on the, the the action yesterday. So those two concepts alone, I mean, uh, would save you from a lot of trouble today. Uh, you would at max, maybe you had one to two positions on, and then you get negative feedback from the market saying, uh, I'm not ready yet. So then you move back to a cash position today without um, losing a lot of your, uh, you know, progress that you've made in, in the larger uptrend that we've had most of 2021. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's super important. Um, what we see a lot of times, you know, is people, uh, <clears throat> they do put exposure up too much um, and the market does come back on them. And then what do you try to do from there? A lot of people try to uh, repair all the damage, you know, in, in one or two trades and uh, really dig themselves into a hole. 
Uh, for people that kind of run into those habits and, and do find themselves uh, digging into a hole, now maybe hearing about progressive exposure for the first time, uh, what, what else, Ray, this is for you one more time, uh, what else would you suggest on top of progressive exposure to look for? So one thing that you're big on is spotting new uh, themes, new groups right. coming up. So that, that first position, one of the things is you want to be in a group that, that might be a potential leadership group. So which group in the market, while the indexes are pulling in or market as a whole are under, you know, as a whole is under pressure, or even the weakness is isolated to just the growth space, which group on, among the growth space is acting well? That's really what you want to key in on. And your first position should really be um, at the moment, if we say, you know, today's action was a complete reversal, but as of yesterday, maybe you put on MRVL or a QCOM or a NVIDIA or AMD um, because the group as a whole, the semi space has been acting really well and your first position should be reflective of something that might lead the next trend. If you're going out um, and we, we get a rally in the markets and you're going back and purchasing RBLX, which is a broken chart, you're purchasing a firm, which is a broken chart, you're purchasing UPSD, those are prior leaders, right? The market sort of moved on from those and they're, they've entered new bases and it's going to take a while until those type of stocks shape up in the markets. What you want to key in on it is those the next round of leaders, which potentially could be the semi semi equipment space or the communication space, something like CIEN uh, at the moment in the market. So that is, you know, it's important to that first position be in a potential leadership group. All right. Awesome. So, uh, Ross, uh, just, we've talked about progressive exposure, um, you know, like not losing, uh, everything in like not not getting into the markets too fast and, and getting wiped out too quickly progressive exposure looking for potential leadership groups um we all obviously have like a very similar approach to the markets um but i'd like to hear specifically from you uh when you're looking for uh new leaders to emerge out of a correction like this uh what are you what are you looking to see first you know i I've kind of learned, you know, I used to say it, it would take a sustainable uptrend will take at least two or three groups of leadership, but you know, some groups are a little bit small. So I, I kind of say it's got to have three solid, at least a couple, two, three solid themes behind it. So whether that, you know, so for example, there's biotech, that group is huge, probably six, 700 stocks. So you, you know, you can get, that's a huge group, you know, within technology, you're not going to have, you know, like one small group of 13 stocks leading the way on the NASDAQ, right? Um, so the bottom line is this, let me keep it very simple. If you were to run, you know, market this up on volume screen, which is probably repeatable just anywhere, when I'm running screens and, I, and I'm seeing, you know, at the top, I'm, so we're small, smaller investors. I'm nowhere near big enough that I'm stuck in stuck having to stay invested the biggest right. largest funds out there so because i have the ability to go to cash i'm not trying to figure out the you know the the northeast banks diversified operations steel producers insurance brokers and you know super regional banks i can squish myself into and pray to god i make some money while the market it doesn't matter you know so the market followed through that's what's showing up for the most part um, as leading the market. And while there's, I would say, some encouraging action out there and stocks that I would say could ultimately support the market, you've still got a ton of volatility out there. You can just look and see there's nothing easy about this market, right? So, you know, sometimes I think about counting cards. I love that movie, 21. Is this a hot deck or a cold deck? It's definitely not a hot deck. Right. So, and I'll throw this into the equation. You know, we always say we want to protect our financial capital and our mental capital. So I look at this as a huge vacation for my brain. So long story short, I want to see two or three themes of those solid leaders where, you know, the ones that actually lead a, a growth market, not the one, the, you know, those what the groups I just discussed where a lot of the big funds may be going to hide that can't go to cash. And so that's why we're seeing the S&P. Um, outperform the Dow outperform, you know, the Russell's been doing horribly, the NASDAQ, um, 
it's been hanging in there, but not it doesn't look as good as the S and P and the Dow. And that all has to do with that rotation into that, you know, those safer, larger cap, more liquid, slower names. Um, and the you know the story with growth is you know some are going down, some might be shaping up. But until I see like let's say a bunch of biotechs, a bunch of techs, and whatever it is, two or three themes and more, we can see the top. Um, let's say three to five stocks in that group in terms of the liquidity, relative strength, um, fundamental quality, all on the chart, starting to curve up off the bottom. The you know at the the launching pad that we talk about is all the relatives yep. for all of the moving averages are getting tight, coming up, curving around, kind of cupping underneath that price. Just about every time that something legitimate showing up, I start to see that across several groups in the market. And I go, ah, here we go. And it's just not there yet. But I would say, you know, there is potential for setup. So it's not like I remember clearly in 2008, there was no magic in getting out of the, out of that market and staying in cash. There was literally, like I couldn't find anything constructive even to hope for. So mm -hmm. in this market, it, I wouldn't say it's, necessarily like that with time we could see new leadership develop in the right areas of the market but just because we had a follow through day it doesn't mean that it's going to be uh smooth sailing and until you start to see that leadership really participate um and broaden it it's going to be you know the chop will will exist hey, can so i ask a question that, yeah um how how would o'neill be handling an environment like this uh knowing what you know you know, well, knowing him, whatever stock he had, he probably had from low enough of a price that he still probably got a huge chunk of it on, whether, you know, his AOL, his Qualcomm, and he's got his stock point. But for the most part, I'd say this is the environment where you'd find most of the firm in cash and waiting. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's everybody gets chopped up. It doesn't stop at William O'Neill and company, I promise you. Um, you just have to, know, you know, understand when that is and how to deal with it you know it's all about those emotions the discipline and that sort of thing because anybody can get chopped up and i do mean anybody uh, absolutely and you definitely uh learn that patience from uh, a series of unfortunate lessons um i personally had a setback uh somebody's mic is really loud i'm not sure if that's you ross but I personally had uh, a very big setback uh, five five years ago that really was a turning point in my trading. Um, I really that's where I I got the discipline finally to uh, really pull it together. Um, so Ross Ray, great explanation. Richard, do you have anything that you'd like to add uh, just on what you'd like to see in general uh, right now? Um. I don't have too much to add outside of what I already said. I, I think it would definitely be good to talk about kind of um, homework and, and what we should be doing during choppy environments like this. Because even though we're not trading, uh, you still have to be active and kind of set yourself up for success during the next uptrend. So, uh, Ray, I, I think I'll kind of throw it over to you um, because I think I've learned a lot when it comes to RS lists and and building up a list of names to potentially trade going, going up when the uptrend resumes basically. Yeah, there is an echo going on, guys. The, Ross, if you want to put yourself on mute on Twitter. Yeah. I, I, it's the same script. So one of the things that, that folks should be doing is uh, keeping track of market cycles. Um, just take a, you know, a notepad file, Microsoft Word, Excel, OneNote, whatever you name it. And every day, um, just write about what happened in the markets and where we are in the market cycle. You'll notice the same pattern to repeat themselves where we go under distribution. Um, we come in, we lose the, the 50 day on the markets or the 21 day uh, breath becomes poor, but then right near when we're about to turn and ready for that next uptrend, that could be, now there are no guarantees in the market. That could be the next, you know, uh, in the next two weeks, could be next six weeks, doesn't matter. But if we keep track of those, you know, that market cycle, what it, what that's going to tell us is right when this trend is about to turn, one, we're going to see decoupling days. Decoupling days are basically when the indexes aren't really showing uh, the true power that's building underneath the surface. So stocks are going up, but indexes are not really showing that. That's a situation that we want to be in. 
because then when the indexes do reflect that action or that powerful action developing underneath the surface, the stocks that are going up are going to go up even more. So one of the things to look for is decoupling days. We usually have one to two decoupling days before we get a solid trend going or as we go into that follow through day. Now, th the other thing uh, is so one is market cycle. Second, just keep track of strong names. It's going to get frustrating. Uh, we, th we all thought, you know, tomorrow was, the uh, you know, yesterday was the day we, we had a fairly solid close stocks were coming in into the morning. I wanted to see support hold wasn't holding. And then the weakness started spreading into, you know, uh, other groups. And then we see that support just caves in and we lost pretty much whatever we did yesterday on the charts. So you, you still have to continue to keep, you know, keep track of strong names, um, keep a list pretty much every day. If not, you know, end of day basis is what I go for, especially in a rough environment. I try to keep myself away from the desk because I know if I'm just sitting here, I'm going to find a reason to trade. And when I have to find a reason to trade, I lose money in the markets. So market cycle, keep your R restless. It's always clear. It's always clear as day which group is gonna or which you know two to three groups, as Ross pointed out, are gonna lead the markets, um, and you just have to be you know persistent in doing that. What happens is we get sort of lazy. Uh, we don't do our homework. We sort of step away, thinking that we'll figure it out when the uptrend resumes. But those first you know day one, day two, and day three of a trend, when the market really gets going, are key when you're trying to establish your long positions, right? And you're trying to put size on so that you can make big progress within the first, you know, one to five days of a new trend getting underway. Um, so that's, I don't know if I answered your question, but market cycle, our rest list. Uh, if you keep doing that, you'll be on the right side when it's time for the trend to resume. Uh, definitely. No, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's super important. So, uh, would you be able to get a little more specific? Uh, so you maintain your RS list now. Uh, what scans are like? What's what's your go-to scan right now for when the markets are like this to find? Because we know, like as you mentioned, the best opportunities do come out of this. Uh, as, I, so I think a very yeah, I think a very simple one is just percent off fifty-two week highs could be one or percent off all-time highs. That's a that's a fairly typical one to find what you need to find. For me, I have a universe of stocks that I operate within. So I have three key watch lists, such as the Gappers IPO and the HDF watch list. I'm sort of operating within that domain to see which ones are holding up well and then start moving them into my focus list. And then by the time that the market's ready, usually my focus list has three to five names that I could really be interested in and put size on uh, those particular names. As for scans, um, I think uh, personally, just that 50 you know percent off all-time highs, percent off, 52 week highs. If the market is below the 21 day, look for stocks near the 10 day, right? Those are the ones. So those are the strong stocks. Um, just very simple stuff uh, to, to at least maintain a universe of strong stocks if and when we do see uh, a trend developing in the markets that's more than, you know, a couple hours. And I can add a little bit on that. So um, something that I really find useful is the closing range. Um, so that's that's basically you take the high and the low and the closing range is basically within that range, where did we close? So if we close at the lows, the closing range is 0%. If we close at the highs, 100%. And on a day when the market really gets destroyed, uh, the closing range is gonna be pretty low on the indexes. So stocks with uh, closing ranges of 60%, 70% and above, that's pretty significant to me. And of course you can also, it, it's fractal. So you can basically take this to a weekly time frame. Um, and basically run a scan like that at the end of the week and basically see what was supported that week when the overall market was down. So that's that's kind of by definition relative strength. Um, also, Ross, I know, I know I've learned this from you. You love the relative strength new high list. Um, obviously, that, that comes into play a little bit later when uh, the market's really been correcting for a while. We see the stocks that are right near those all-time highs and the relative strength line is breaking into new high ground um, as the market is usually just coming off its low. So I'd love to hear about kind of how you uh, use that relative strength new high um, scan and kind of what you look for in general, because I did catch a lot of the winners last year in 2020, uh, DocuSign, Zoom, uh, those were showing incredible relative strength uh, coming off the March correction bottoms. And you got to unmute on Twitter, by the way. I found that, so as I'm running my, you know, so I'm, I'm running my screens, creating my list, setting alerts. 
I don't know, half a, to half a dozen times a day, give or take Monday through Sunday. So I, I keep a, a running picture of the market and leadership in my mind. And so at, as we start to notice those groups that are shaping up, I, my eyes go straight to that relative strength line. It's just a habit I've developed. Right. So it's, you know, um, it's, but it is during that time, right? Where after the market's corrected or we're coming out of a correction and we're starting to see the strength, that's where it becomes the most obvious. Like the big ones, will, you'll have a relative strength line sometimes going to new high ground way, way before the price as a stock's just building a right side, which, you know, which we saw with a few of those stocks um, that you just mentioned. So, I mean, it all goes hand in hand. You're not gonna really start seeing those relative strength new highs in, in you know, the legit stocks that you want to buy until you also can clearly see the rotation back into, you know, the part of the market that's going to really help sustain a, a new solid uptrend. And for people who don't know, could you just kind of talk about the relative strength line in general? And because a lot of people probably are familiar with RSI versus the relative strength line. So, so what is it in general, first of all? It, it very, it's very simple. It's just telling you which are the um, strongest stocks in the market. So it's often, your, your stock weighted against the S&P 500, um, you know, Investors Business Daily assigns a ranking to it, one through 99, their highest ranked relative strength stocks have a 99 um, rating, you know, the lowest R1. Um, I'm, I lost my train of thought there. What, what was your... Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically uh, talk a little bit about the indicator, what makes it so useful. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, just how it is. So, that it's basically... Ray, what is that calculation again? You you know, what is that very simply to uh, make it understandable for folks that... Sorry, uh, oh. we're talking about our RS line new yeah, before press? Just yeah, the relative so strength line in general. The, yeah. Yeah, just that calculation. Yeah, so so the calculation, calculation of the yeah. So calculation of the RS line is basically um you're taking a ratio, right? How how is a stock performing relative to an index? So it's a simple ratio. You just do a division of this the symbol divided by the the S P, or some people could use the NASDAQ because if you're in the growth market and you want to be more in tune with the technology space or the growth space in the markets, you could do that. Or some people even uh, do a ratio versus the FFTY, which is the IBD50 ETF, which personally I feel is not really a best reflection uh, based slowly on you know how the methodology behind how they're managing uh, the positions there, but you could still do a ratio on that. So typical is to do a ratio versus the S&P 500. That will give you uh, the gist of it. In recent markets, there have been times where the S&P is holding up, but the NASDAQ is getting, you know, uh, pulling in 2% and the S&P is flat and the Russell is up one and a half percent. So we've seen that sort of action as well that, that might make you question uh, that methodology for sure. But that's what the markets are. You always have to adapt Markets are changing. You have to change with the markets. You can't just sit here and say that O'Neill told me 50 years ago that I'm supposed to be using S&P and no matter what, I'm going to be using S&P. We have to adapt to you know, different conditions, different markets with the way market function and, and how the market structure is changing over the past several uh, years. So tr you, know, you try all of them, see what, what's you know, working best for you. Don't say that you know i read this somewhere as someone told me actually go out there and prove it to yourself that whatever you're using is effective and that is that's not only just isolated to rs line that applies to every aspect or everything that you try to apply in your trading awesome awesome explanation uh one thing i did want to circle back on uh when we were talking about progressive exposure and you know getting back into the market letting the market invite you uh, invite you in. One thing that Ross uh, has had an impact on me over the years on uh, is that he says, you know, when you're doing the right thing, it, it normally doesn't feel comfortable. And uh, I think that's something really important to stress because like, yeah, you don't want to jump the gun and get in too early. You want to make sure that you're seeing what you want to see. But of course, it's going to like uh, the market's choppy volatile like it's it, you're not going to have the like too much confidence uh you're not you're not going to feel too confident so you want to you're definitely not going to feel comfortable uh if you're you're, you're generally going to feel pretty uncomfortable what i see a lot of times is you know like uh a week or two weeks after you're supposed to be like getting invested people are asking uh, if it's if it's now a good time and at that time you know uh is generally when we're going to see a pullback and so 
uh, you know, like after the market's proved uh, what you want to see and you do have that confidence, you're generally going to be uh, a little too late. Uh, it doesn't mean you miss the majority of the move, but uh, there's no reason to jump in at that point. Now you have to wait for uh, some other factors to set up. But yeah, I just wanted to highlight that that, that is really important. Um, and you, you are going to feel uh, uncomfortable when you are getting back into that market. Um, so, uh, Richard, mm -hmm. what are you, uh, what stock specific, do you have any specific names that you are uh, looking to looking to invest in as, as soon as you, you get what you want? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so, unfortunately, a lot of my names coming into this week in general were, were the semiconductor names, NVIDIA, AMD, Qualcomm, um, AVGO, uh, other than that, CIN, which uh, Ray mentioned earlier, was also on my list. Uh, basically, stocks that were pretty much holding up um, with their structures while the overall market was still very choppy and, um, and a little bit iffy. So um, a lot of those today, if you just take a look at the chart of Qualcomm, and I'll, I'll paste the chart at the top of the space in just a second, but um, it was showing nice relative strength, holding that 10-day, as Ray was mentioning, as the market was kind of around its 21-day um, here. And it, it had basically an all-time closing high yesterday. And then we had a gap up today and basically a sell-off after that open. Uh, so definitely a character change. We're seeing heavy volume to the downside. Uh, now that's kind of two failed breakouts, one on the downside reversal on 12.13 uh, a few days ago, and then one obviously today. Um, so it might not just be ready yet, uh, but it's still holding above kind of 170. Um, it's still within a flat base pattern it might just be the overall market kind of weighing it down. So as of this moment, I've still got my eyes on it. I still think it's it's one of the better looking charts out there. Uh, we had a, the uh, basically a gap up on the highest volume ever or the highest volume in the past 250 days, 11.4. It made nice progress from that point. And now it's just kind of forming a flat base uh, right near all time high. So it still looks pretty good. Um, definitely showing relative strength versus uh, a chart like if you pull up NVIDIA, which is another kind of leader within that space, let me pull that up here. Let me type it correctly. Um, so this one is back near its 50 day. And if you just look at the chart compared to Qualcomm, it's kind of keeling over a little bit. Um, now it did show a lot of strength yesterday after the Fed announcement, uh, but we had a kind of failed move up here. Once again, a gap and then push all the way uh, down almost to yesterday's lows. Um, it didn't undercut yesterday's lows, which is definitely a good sign. Uh, but if if it really undercuts those lows, undercuts the 50-day, I think the chart starts looking um, a little bit more broken. And Qualcomm, to me, to my eye, just looks a little bit stronger, um, although I'm kind of focused on both of them. Um, another semi name that I'm sure a lot of people have questions about, AMD, is kind of closer to the NVIDIA example versus Qualcomm. Uh, the chart isn't broken yet, but it has pull, pulled back now about 20% from its highs. So uh, that's a decent amount, could be forming a base here, but it might just go sideways for a few weeks until the overall market sorts itself out. Um, so keep an eye on those stocks that are holding above moving averages that the market isn't, um, that are going sideways at, as the market is going down. Uh, that's another sign of relative strength. Um, so other than that, um, I did have my eye on um, SIMO, Silicon Motion Technology Corp. Um, this had a really nice breakout from, um, I believe, either stage one or stage two base. Um, if you look at a monthly chart, it's just kind of making a move uh, from the highs back in 2018. And then it had a nice breakout on 12.7 on really nice volume if you bring up a chart here. And all it's done is pull back into the 10-day on lighter volume. So completely normal action. Um, and that's, that's showing strength when the market is correcting here. Um, and this, this, if you look at the relative strength line, um, is right near all-time highs. It was making RS new highs um, as the market was correcting and definitely high up on my list. Uh, we could just get a few uh, more days or one week or two, and this could really shape up nicely within a flat base. So those are a few names that I'm watching. Um, but yeah, any questions on, on that or yeah, anything else I said, Nick? I don't know. Uh, not, not specifically. I, I wanted to uh, go back to uh, Ross. This is for you. You mentioned that there are certain groups that can hold up uh, the market and there are certain groups that, you know, can hold up the market. 
So when you're looking, you know, at a, at a time like this, uh, what, like, can you, can you just elaborate? Cause I know we get that question a lot. What, sure, like, sure, what, sure, can you explain sure. a group that can hold up the market versus one that can't? I, listen, I would say this. Um, so you know, software group versus the sector, right? It's going to take more than one smaller software group. I don't know whether it be security alone or just enterprise software or whatever you much more that's why i was saying i don't know that it's a sector but if you know a theme that's going to possibly include more than just so we've got some strength in semiconductors i saw a few of those starting to weaken and break the you know while there are some stronger names those actually started to uh break a little bit today um but so t to me right now we've seen strength in semiconductors i've seen a few networking names pop up you know that's on the technology side um, haven't seen a whole lot going on. So specialty retail would be one of those areas. You know, a bigger theme would, you know, like the whole uh, comeback from COVID theme was one of those things. And, you know, where we saw, and that's that's also really helpful, right? Because then you get, um, you know, the stuff that, like the trucking, transportation, shipping, and all of that, that really adds to the, you know, rally, so, you know, and the, the breadth. So there's a lot of times you'll see those stock tracks rallying and exhibiting strength and there are ones that i know guys will actively trade whether they be some of the um higher earnings and relative strength shipping stocks a lot of the energy and oil so it's not that the market's untradeable that's just not my style that's not where i've made my money is trying to you know work those stocks in an environment like this i look at that more as like the wait. let's wait and see what happens so i would say a very a group in and of itself that could you know hold its own is the biotechs like I discussed before. Um, but it would really take, you know, like uh, a theme in tech, whether it be software, storage and networking together. I don't know what it'd be. Maybe um, we start to get a pushback on metaverse. Obviously, um, cryptocurrency was a, was a bit of a theme. Looks like Coinbase got their IPO started too late. Um, you know, there wasn't a whole bunch of them. The SI was probably the uh, one higher quality, um, big benefactor of it all, but that could come back into, so it's gonna have to be something like that, right? So it's gonna be newer names. It could be in in the same groups. You might see the few of the, the ones that we saw working prior come back if they're early enough in their overall move. Um, but yeah, it's gonna take more than just strength and semiconductors, a, a few networking names, and then you know the other stuff that honestly, it's not that I don't pay attention to it, but those aren't the stocks that I'm buying when the market's in great shape. To me, those are you know the areas that are work that are showing most of um, where the most demand is, rotation is into is like you know all of that you know hide out in chemicals, you know the general machinery, northeast banks, regional banks, insurance, you name it. Um, yep. You know, we can always find the, the good looking names in those groups, but if I don't have to be invested in those names, it's just not what I do. Mm -hmm. um, so again, until I see, and honestly, it's gonna take you, we'll see them all starting to come up off the bottom and create that launching pad, if you will, that area, all the moving at, this is just something that I've noticed. Anytime the market's coming, that we're coming off of correction, um, follow through day or not when the market's ready to go, and it's always clear, there's no magic to it. Um, it's very obvious to everyone. The whole thing is having the patience to wait till you see them all curving around the bottom and you're just seeing all those setups. You know, those points where you're like, holy cow, look at all the setups. I don't, you know, I don't have enough money and I'm fully margined. That's what I'm waiting for. It's, there's no magic. We'll all know when it's there. Just quit chopping yourself up until we get there. That's the hard part to be quite honest with you. Yeah, that's uh, that's extremely hard. Uh, so, what's the longest that that you've been in cash for? Uh, what's the longest you've stayed cash? You know, during that period from, you know, two thousand to two thousand two ish, three ish, you know, when the market finally bottomed, but I jumped in and out and caught myself. Not, when I say I chopped myself up, nothing big, but I, I, you know, was lose a little money here and there, but it's also how I learned to. Um, figure out when, you know, that real time is to get back in the market, when that deck is hot, when the, when the odds are with me and I can minimize my risk. So I know that if we get a follow through day, 
and I'm seeing three or four groups with some solid stories, earnings, and like a legit theme behind it all, come, you know, showing those signs of accumulation along the bottom, big upside volume, lower downside volume, all of your moving averages converging to the upside nice and tight. You will see that. I, I would never say guarantee, but I think we'll all see that start to happen in the groups that are working. The best stocks in those groups, that's where you start to see the relative strength lines start to pop. And for me, anyway, that every I'm, I'm going to tell you that every time that it's worthwhile for me to get reinvested from correction mode, that's what it looks like. Now, you know, the market actually bottomed late in 2002 after that 2000 correction, I want to say November-ish. It was very difficult to make any money using Bill's methodology until summertime, June-ish, May, June. And then once it clicked, it was off to the races. But it was very easy to get chopped up. So I was mostly cash between that period, you know, trying here and there. And when I, and trust me, when I tell you I was there, getting chopped up doesn't end, you know, doesn't end at William O'Neill and company. It, you know, there's a reason market school was invented. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, the, uh, so that, that just kind of brings me to uh, another question you get asked a lot is, you know, uh, when we get a follow through day, am I, am I automatically like, am I automatically going to buy? Uh, and what we want to ideally see is what you just mentioned. You see tons of setups everywhere. Um, you really want to, uh, you're really overwhelmed by the amount of setups you're scanning and you just have idea after idea after idea. Uh, and that's what uh, I kind of mentioned earlier about the market inviting you in um, when, you know, you kind of know, like when you see it um, after so many cycles as well, um, you kind of just uh, recognize, I guess, what you want to see. But, you know, if we do get a follow through day and you can't find a setup anywhere, then you can't look at it, in my opinion, as the same quality uh, as one so it, it all depends on the context uh, and the general market and what leadership looks like. Give a fair comparison. I, I would say if you were to look back just prior to our last follow through day, the leaders were, were telling you we were going to follow through. Leaders were, were screaming by me before the follow, a few days before the follow through day happened. But that's not happening this time. Nowhere close to it. So I'm to... The funny thing is, I'll tell you, everyone who's been at it using the same methodology, we probably 90% have 90% overlap on our stock lists. Finding the stocks isn't the problem. I don't even think finding the entries is the problem. I think waiting and having the discipline and the patience for that to, to, to really uh, show up and say it's worth taking my brain off vacation to for potential aggravation through, you know, losing money, getting back into the market because it's part of the process. So. If I'm going to give my, you know, take my brain off vacation and start putting my hard-earned money back into the market in, you know, a worthwhile way, um, I need to, you know, it, the market will tell us every time. And I don't know that I can always describe exactly what I'm seeing. Obviously, I've been, I've been doing exactly what I do the same way for over 20 years now. So, you know, to an extent, I have a feel, right, for, you know, the what it should look like and so but the best way i can describe it is there's rarely a, a time i don't think there's a single time i can remember that we didn't see you know the leadership clearly um letting you know which groups it was that were all starting to form right sides together and before you know it you have more stocks to buy than you know what to do with and it you know it's waiting for them that's so hard definitely and something that i know you mentioned that like that that's not something that you see at this moment uh, in this correction right now, but uh, something else important to, to highlight is that, you know, things can change pretty quickly. Uh, you know, uh, another week things can shape up and charts could look a lot different. Uh, and so like, you never get glued too much to one observation. You know, that's why we're constantly at TL always setting alerts and always waiting to see what's hitting our levels and, and what deserves our attention uh, because you just never, you, you never know, uh, you know, that's the raised point as far as doing homework for most people that have other jobs to do, children to take care of, relationships to maintain, just life to live. Um, the homework is important because like you said, it's amazing how many times I've thought the market looks hopeless and then six, you know, six days later, I see setups everywhere. So staying on top of that market, you won't miss it if you, if you create a discipline to at least sit down once a day, go through the market, see where the rotation is 
is go in and take a look at some charts and see if you can start to see some legitimate can slim stocks working up the right side of a new base. It's pretty much that simple. Awesome. Thank you. Can I, I jump in with uh, a question, Nick? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Bross, I was wondering, um, obviously, uh, our, our kind of methodology, um, basically, uh, the way we look at things, a lot of stuff is baked into the price action, and that's what's most important. But I was wondering if kind of the macro backdrop with, with the Fed kind of tightening their policy and, and QE lessening, um, I wonder if that comes into your process at all. And, and yeah, how you just how you basically interpret that? You know, I've never made any money doing, you know, analysis of the, the macroeconomics. However, you definitely want to pay close attention, right? I mean, even Bill would tell you, don't fight the Fed. However, just because the Fed is starting to tighten, you know, now everyone's doing their analysis, I'm sure, of, you know, where real GDP growth is versus inflation and all that. And I, I can't, I have no idea about any of that. Um, what I can tell you is a lot of that rally, that 98 to 2000 rally happened in a rising interest rate environment. You know, that's that wall of worry. So I don't really have a problem with it. We've seen plenty of scary news that just doesn't matter. The leader, you know, and again, the leaders will tell you, you know, in 2008, I want to tell you that my fundamental guys could not find a reason to be negative on the market or the economy. And I couldn't have been more negative just based on the lead, what the leaders were doing. So yes and no. I mean, I want to understand what the Fed is doing, um, but I'm not going to say, oh, my goodness, the Fed's going to you know, tighten the next meet seven meetings in a row. There's no way I'm buying stocks. That, that doesn't work. That kind of, you know, it seems obvious, but I'll tell you right now, it doesn't work. So. Definitely. Yeah. I think, uh, I think that's a lot of people, you know, get surprised when they, they hear that, like how little attention we kind of pay to certain things. Uh, but, you know, I did tweet earlier today about uh, having focus as a trader and the importance of it uh, specifically focus on, you know, charts uh, because they will tell you everything you need. Um, and, you know, if, if you pay attention, like uh, you, you'll just, you'll, you'll notice a whole lot more. The, the, the charts are always going to tell the story. The charts are the story. Um, and so it's important that if you pay attention to everything and you try to understand a little bit of everything, the problem with that, uh, I tried it, you know, a long time ago. And the problem with that is that, uh, when you, when you're kind of dipped into everything and you're trying to understand it all, you, you're constantly getting mixed signals. Uh, every, you know, you're always going to get a signal that doesn't match like with something else. And so, uh, that's why, uh, I also mentioned, you want to refine and simplify your process? Uh, you, you definitely want to make sure that uh, you, you have some like a, a pretty simple checklist of what you want to see. Uh, and that's it, because anything more complex than that, like we said, we're going to hesitate. You're probably going to get into the market uh, when it's too late. It's going to pull back on you. You're going to feel like the market's specifically out to get you. Uh, it's a cycle. And so, uh, yeah, a very simple checklist to get back involved in the market. Can uh, I jump in something I would yeah, I, yep. I, I, w I would like to add right. to that as well. So there's there's basically two parts to it. Yes, go out and try stuff. But at, at the end of the day, when you're executing in the markets, you're out there to make money. So make no mistake that your execution and your rules of execution and how you, you know, increase exposure, those have to be studied, solidified, time tested by you type of rules. The other part of it is, yes, I, I feel, I mean, me, I always go out and try to learn, you know, things outside my system, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to be incorporating them uh, in the next two days in my system and try to make money off of it. Right. So I feel, you know, the, the other knowledge is also important, but you, you only execute on what you're confident in so that try to, you know, try to separate those two because when it's game time and, you, and you're trying to, uh, try a new move when playing basketball, you, you're going to look like an idiot and the market's going to make you look like an idiot. But when you've, you know, practiced the move behind the scenes, you, you've sort of, you know, practice your, you know, three point shot or whatever the case might be, or your crossover, and then you try to implement it in the game. That's a whole different feel to it because you've put in the work behind the scenes. So try to set, you know, yes, try, try new things, try different things, but keep that behind the scenes. Don't make, you know, a lot of people and, and you know me included uh when, when i didn't have an edge in the market 
markets, I would find something new and I would just try it the next day to see what happens. If it works, then I would stick to it for a week or two. And then the week that it doesn't work, I let it go and I switch to something else. That's not the way to be going about it. So work on your, you know, that recent interview by with Richard and Jared, I think really, you know, work on your C game, try to make your C game a little bit better uh, behind the scenes. And then when you're executing, that's your A game. Like you're executing on your A game. You're not executing on your C game. Uh, in the markets. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that's uh, it's really important for people to understand that and really put in the work to feel that confidence for yourself, because until you do put in that work and feel that confidence and, you know, really take ownership for every aspect of your trading, uh, you, you're just, you'll never feel uh, right when you're executing. And at the end of the day, you know, it all comes down to your execution. Uh, Richard, you Looked like, uh, did, did you have a question before? Yeah, um, I, I think we should maybe talk about um, kind of uh, something that Ray and, and Ross, you, you as well have kind of ingrained in me, uh, why we we buy based on fundamentals and technicals, but sell only on technicals. Um, and a lot of the charts from the leaders from, from 2020 originally, SE, Roku, um, they've gotten hit pretty hard and, and they've been in downtrends for a few weeks now. Um, and there still are some people who, who are kind of holding on, um, uh, lo longer term minded folks, more investors. Uh, but from our point of view, they're not necessarily going to be the leaders coming out of the, the, the next correction or whatever. Um, they've gotten hit pretty hard. They're going to need time to, to basically, uh, rebase, consolidate, and that could take years. We just don't know. Um, but I'd like to just kind of throw it out to everybody, um, Basically, the, the the chart tells the whole story, as I think, Nick, you said that. And I think you have to recognize that, especially as a trader, uh, when the chart um, is set up right and all of that. Um, and basically also know as well when you're just kind of push it because it was a name that was doing well last year. You got you got to kind of take every market cycle as its own and reevaluate what the leaders are in the market. And, and Ross, did you have something to add to that? Oh, you're, you're unmuted. I thought I heard you come on. No, I didn't have much to add. I, you know, that was just along the lines of how I ended. That was the point of me saying, yeah. you know, I couldn't have been more negative. Fundamental guys couldn't, you know, and eventually the fundamentals catch up, um, but it takes a while. So absolutely, I'd say, you know, it. Otherwise, for example, and, and the, the, the harder part of that is the, the biggest, you know, like a Cisco or what, you know, those types of big leaders will continue to show phenomenal um, earnings for off it, you know, four, six and eight quarters after they fault dropped 80 percent. So that's the, you, that's what you're trying to avoid. It's very that's just the way it happens. You can't the fundamentals come after the technical break every time. Yeah, I think Ray, you've you said this a bunch, like in in the videos that I've done with you, is uh, the story can stay the same, but the price action can completely change the script. Yeah, I mean, with respect to you know, uh, let's just take a firm as as an example. It all depends on what what your goal is in the markets. If you're an investor, you have a different set of rules and uh, you know things that you operate on. It could be multiples. It could be uh, whatever you feel. Uh, some, something that's repeatable in the markets is what we're basically functioning on. Be it investors, to, you know, day traders, swing traders, position traders, doesn't, doesn't matter what you are in the markets. You're, you're trying to function on something that gives you an edge and you, you try to repeatedly execute that edge. Now, if you're an investor, that's perfectly fine. You, you could sit through 50, you know, 50% uh, basis and you want to hold on for two to three years. That's a whole different story. If you're, if you're a trader, and you're turning into an investor because a name came back in from from the 170s to the 110s, then that that's a problem. That's not you becoming a really good investor because you're still down 20 to 30 percent on your position, right? Um, so it's important to know what your role is in the markets. It's important to know what your objective is in the markets. If you're turning from a position trader to an investor and then flipping back to being a swing trader and trying to figure it out on a per position basis, I guarantee you, you're going to lose your money very, very, very quickly in the markets. So knowing your role, knowing what your job is, knowing, you know, if you're a day trader, your job is you should be cash when that bell rings, no matter what, right? Or 
if you're a swing trader, if you know, if a stock is three to four to five percent below your entry point, you didn't time it well because swing traders time the markets. That's the whole point of swing trade. You're timing the markets, right? Uh, position trading is, is really the same thing. If you're using the 10 week line, uh, which is a, a line of institutional support, you're in a firm, a firm broke the 10 week line about four, four to six weeks ago. You should be out of that position at this point in time. If you're still holding on, you have turned into an investor, you've made a mistake because you're trying to switch your time frames on the fly. So just with anything, I mean, there, there's a lot of, you know, the bickering on social media and things of that nature with, you know, different time frames. I feel, you know, as long as you have repeatable rules and you have a repeatable edge in the markets, uh, if your system says you're allowed to sit through a 50% base, even though, because your multiples are looking good or something like that, then that's what you have to do. As a swing trader, when you're wrong, you have to take that loss. You have to move on to the next one, find the next round of leaders. And that's what, that's your job. You have to be doing that repeatedly so that you can make a, make a return in the markets. Awesome. That was, uh, that was great. That's super important. Uh, well, we've been on for an hour. Uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, we will be hosting spaces weekly and inviting some really awesome guests on to speak with us. So I hope that you will continue to join us. Uh, we have some really, really cool stuff planned. Uh, we'll have some interesting conversations. And uh, as we're learning spaces, you know, we'll get a lot better with sharing some charts and relevant tweets up top and uh, making it interactive. But uh, does anybody have any last thoughts they want to share before before we end this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, with respect to the current markets or just anything, I would say continue to do your homework. Yes, it's frustrating. We were up yesterday, down today. We've, you know, uh, me personally, my signal, you know, my system has seen some sort of signal noise where we're, we're supposed to be increasing exposure, but I see nothing in the markets to ex increase exposure with. So I've been more on the index side of things. Just you know, uh, when I get a, uh, a a signal to increase exposure in the markets, I've been doing that through SPXL, TQQQ, rather than individual names because I just don't see much from an individual standpoint. So you know, persistent, you know, just being consistent with your homework, things of that nature. Those are super important. And the goal is, you know, if you survive for a span of three to five years, you'll eventually make it through that consistency phase and actually um, see a return in the market. It's just to getting through that and seeing enough cycles so that you could exploit the market cycle uh, in your favor. That's really what's important. Awesome way to end. All right. Uh, if you are still listening uh, and with us, uh, go ahead and follow us if you do not on the trader line handle. Um, thank you again for being here with us tonight. And that wraps up our first space. So have a good night, everyone. And we'll talk to you later. Mm -hmm.